Hello, my name is Tessa Asquith-Lamb and I'm an artist. I work at the City Arts Centre and other venues, running workshops and also leading described tours for the visually impaired. In today's described tour video, we're going to be describing paintings from the exhibition Shifting Vistas, 250 Years of Scottish Landscapes. The Scottish landscape has always been a rich source of inspiration for artists, from crashing coastal waters to calm locks, soaring mountains to soft green hillsides and dramatic cityscapes. An artist might be drawn to an area's remoteness, feeling at one with the vast mountainous surroundings, or maybe more at home in a quiet village where human presence has marked the landscape and created a haven. Of course, in Scotland we have the vagaries of the weather to contend with, but these conditions can sometimes add to a piece's atmosphere and appeal. Recording the different feelings created in response to a landscape has created a huge variety of artworks, and this exhibition includes works by some of Scotland's most prominent artists, from centuries past to the present age, all drawn from the City Arts Centre's collection of fine art. I'm going to start by describing a painting from way back in 1759 by the French artist William Delacour. It is titled View of Edinburgh and it's an oil on canvas painting measuring 108.2 centimetres high by 229 centimetres wide. So this is a landscape format painting, quite wide and epic in scale to encompass a wide view looking at the city of Edinburgh from the east. It's one of the earliest known surviving large scale views of the city. The city skyline stretches across the middle of the painting, coming to a little over halfway, creating a strong, darker lower half filled with fields and scattered figures in the foreground. A view of the city with prominent buildings in the middle ground and light, airy, pale sky above the scene. The sky is blue, but covered by a froth of white clouds all over, almost like waves on the sea. There's a patch of pure blue sky behind the horizon on the far left, but apart from that, the clouds are painted all over the blue sky in a lively way. To the centre right, a diagonal rain shower seems to be happening, a smudge of grey-brown denoting rain clouds falling towards the distinctive crown-shaped top of St Giles Cathedral. Moving down the painting, on the far left is a pointy-topped rocky outcrop covered in green vegetation. Below this are several pale reddish farm buildings with terracotta roofs. Moving towards the centre left are grander, larger buildings in the mid-ground, dominated by the squat form of Holyrood Abbey, which is placed centre left. Its Gothic arches and buttresses are clearly marked out by the bright sunlight on its end wall, which faces us. The sides of the building to the right are in shadow. To the left of the Gothic Abbey building, the adjacent palace looks crisp and more modern in style. Two long rows of windows below a bluish roof. Moving to the right of the Abbey, more of Edinburgh's chaotic jumble of buildings are represented in the distance by their rooftops, stretching out towards the ups and downs of the horizon. To the far right is the Tower of St Giles Cathedral and the outline of Edinburgh Castle against the sky. The landscape nearer to us is peopled by brightly lit figures and animals dotted about like toy figures in a toy farm. They stand among lush dark green fields and are engaged in rural activities, reminding us how the city itself is concentrated into one busy area at this time and the surroundings are still farmland. From left to right, a lady in blue with a yellow bodice stands to the left. She holds a baby up as if showing them the view. She is in profile, looking left and has bare feet. Towards the centre, a more dynamic figure in a lilac skirt and a blue corseted bodice has her back to us. Her white apron blows in the breeze. Her right arm gestures towards a group of two women bent over carrying packs on their backs and a man in a brown coat and blue breeches leaning on a stick slightly further away. A further figure in a red coat seems to stand lower down the hill, visible from the waist upwards. Three cows appear in the centre, one brown and white looking straight at us, and two black and white stand busy eating grass. A cart stands in front of them. Even further away on the right are two figures, a man and a woman, walking towards the city. A small group of sheep scattered to their right shelter under a rocky outcrop. 
To the far right, two women and a man in a red coat are positioned by a scattering of pale rectangles on the grass near the edge of a pool of blue water. This is probably washing left out to dry in the sun. Directly above them, painted in with great accuracy, is a little pale walled cottage, one storey high, with a central chimney on its grey roof. It seems so carefully painted, it must have been a landmark building. William Delacour was born in 1700 and died in 1767. He worked as a theatre set designer in London before coming to Scotland in the late 1750s. He became the first master of the Trustees Academy, the principal art facility for professional artists in Scotland at that time. This artwork does have something of the scenic backdrop about it, and you can imagine it on stage, creating an effect of a wide landscape filled with little figures for scale. The way the abbey is painted so carefully suggests it may have been commissioned as an official record of a new stone roof that had replaced older timber vaulting at this time. Sadly, this was to collapse only nine years later, leaving the abbey a ruin as it is today. Zooming forward in time, we have next a more recent view of Edinburgh, this time by Sir John Lavery, titled View of Edinburgh from the Castle, from 1917. This is an oil on canvas work measuring 63.5 centimetres high by 75.5 centimetres wide and is landscape in format. The painting shows Edinburgh in the autumn of 1917 from high up on the castle walls looking over the esplanade towards Salisbury Crags and Arthur's Seat. It is painted with loose impressionistic brushstrokes and the overwhelming colours are intense blues and purples. Dividing the painting up into rough horizontal thirds, the top third contains the central form of Arthur's seat, blue against a paler blue sky. Below it, to the left in dark blue with sandy highlights, is the rocky form of Salisbury Crags jutting in from the left. A misty pale fog drifts at the foot of the crags. The central third contains the vast sprawl of the city. Buildings, rooftops and towers appear to rise from soft dabs of painted tones in mostly blues and purples, but with an intense patch of green grass to the centre right. Towers and domes here and there in the soft brushstrokes indicate key landmark buildings. It reminds us how tightly packed together the city is, bordered by the natural barrier of Arthur's Seat on one side and the hill on which the castle sits on the other. On the far left, stretching from the centre into the top third, is the tall spire of the Tollbooth Kirk at the top of the Royal Mile. The left of the lower third contains the vast open area of the Castle Esplanade, a sandy coloured flat area used for parades and more recently the tattoo every summer. A scattering of tiny figures dotted across the open area gives us a sense of how high up we are. Some greenery on the far left brings in the composition, as does the vast stonework of the ramparts to the right, forming a strong diagonal in the right corner in pale beige and lilac. The colours harmonise into blues and lilacs with some warmer tones of sand and beige. It's quite dreamlike and refreshing in its blue harmonies. Sir John Lavery was born in Belfast in 1856 and died in 1941. He moved to Scotland as a teenager before attending art schools in London and Paris. He was associated with the Glasgow Boys in the 1880s, who were known for their depictions of modern life. He developed a reputation as a society portraitist before working as an official war artist during World War I, painting naval subjects around Britain. This painting was completed whilst he was also producing pictures of the fleet and military installations on the Firth of Forth. The next painting is a work by Samuel John Peplow titled Iona, Mull and Ben Moore in the Distance. It's an oil on canvas work from around 1929 and measures 51 centimetres high by 61 centimetres wide, so quite small. A loosely painted image in tones of blue, turquoise, pink and grey. Dividing the image into horizontal thirds, the top third shows the distant silhouettes of mountains against the sky. The mountains get taller on the right, and more of the sky is visible top left. Similar mid-blue brush strokes, made with quite a broad brush, create a loose breezy sense of a sunlit sky with white clouds. Some grey tones on the mountains create shaded areas to the right. The middle third contains the beautiful turquoise sea waters around the island of Iona, lighter towards the bottom of the middle third. 
In front of this band of sea and obscuring it to the left is a large rock formation, painted partly with quite a dry brush, dark outlines creating a sense of the angles of the rock against paler tones of pink, blue and white. The rocks end abruptly in a pale pink white sandy layer which occupies the lower horizontal third. This is the sand in front of where the artist has chosen to paint. Here and there are dark rocks and horizontal brush strokes in red-orange, perhaps seaweed or sticks on the beach. The whole painting feels sunlit and warm. The beautiful sea really is that intense turquoise blue around Iona and the pale sands contrast against this beautifully. Samuel John Peplow was one of a small group of artists known as the Scottish Colourists. He was born in 1871 and died in 1935. He began painting images of Iona after being introduced to the island by his friend and fellow colourist F.C.B. Caddle in 1920. He was to return to the island most years until his death, painting mostly the north side of the island which allowed him to paint the view towards Mull. This rocky landscape evidently appealing more to him than the grassy southern side. He favoured working outdoors and this perhaps accounts for the immediacy and freshness of this painting. Next I'll describe one of my favourite images from the exhibition, Wilhelmina Barnes Graham's Rocks, St Mary's, Silly Isles, an oil on board painting dating from 1953. It measures 102.8 centimetres high by 114.3 centimetres wide. This is a much more enigmatic image charged with an almost surreal mood. A huge sculptural rock, crisply delineated, fills most of the lower three quarters of the image. Its predominantly sandy tones of yellowish beige with dark shadows giving a sense of weight and structure. Above this rock is an intense, thin slice of bright blue sea in the distance, appearing towards the top left, moving towards the centre, where the mass of the giant rock interrupts the colour. It then re-emerges centre right before being hidden by a softly rounded hill towards the far right, topped by a jaunty building with a central tower, almost like a child's sandcastle on a pile of sand at the beach. Beyond the sea is a narrow strip of distant land and the suggestion of rocks and structures against a paler but still intense blue sky, a flat gorgeous band of colour occupying the top third of the painting. All the sandy coloured surface of the rock formation and the buildings and the shore in the distance are drawn into with tiny lines, almost like scratches into the paint. The huge rock seems to be made of flat curving strata and is rounded at the bottom and wider at the top. The crisp layers feel like the petals of a rose but thicker and chunkier. The top edges are bitten away into curves by time. The rock is lit from the left and here it is bright and sunlit with pale gold tones. Towards the right, darker shadows anchor the form to the landscape. I love how the rock and the landscape feel like a sculpture, are becoming more abstract yet are tied to reality by the buildings and more conventional landscape elements behind. The sheer scale of the rock is difficult to imagine. Is it huge and weighty or are we seeing a tiny pebble through the artist's eye? The painting is based on the rock formations the artist encountered on the Isles of Scilly, an area she visited many times. Born in 1912 in St Andrews, Wilhelmina Barnes Graham trained at Edinburgh College of Art. She's associated with the south coast of England, moving to Cornwall in 1940 after her studies to become an established member of the St Ives School alongside other modernists such as Barbara Hepworth, Ben Nicholson and Peter Lanyon. Finally, a more modern image here with a work by Victoria Crow titled Beech Tree Winter, an oil on panel work from 1973. It measures 122.3 centimetres high by 91.5 centimetres wide, an unusual portrait format for a landscape piece. The painting shows two dark trees towards the left of the painting, one growing from the lower left and another centre left. The closest tree has a narrower trunk and grows with a slight bend in it before the twiggy branches erupt upwards in a fan shape. A single thin branch grows from the trunk lower left. The second tree is much broader in the trunk and stands a field's distance away, nearer to the centre of the image. Its thin branches sweep over towards the right as if the wind has blown them. 
The fields the two trees stand in are laid out like a patchwork of horizontal bands of colour. The lowest band nearest to us is a warm brown, the loose brush strokes suggesting grasses. A wire fence made up of squares of wire strung between wooden posts marks the edge of the brown field. Beyond this and the first tree is a golden yellow field with again a suggestion of grassy textures in the way the paint is handled. It is within this field that the second larger tree grows. Behind the tree the land slopes down towards the right creating diagonal bands of black, sand and grey stripes. Beyond these diagonals it is a vivid orange or russet field wider on the right creating a triangle of colour across the painting with its point at the left. A third tree, much smaller than the others, grows centre right from this orange background. Two further bands of fields occupy the top third of the painting, one soft green and then one very dark blue towards the horizon. The pale sky in a band at the top of the image highlights the delicate mesh of the winter branches against the sky. The textures and surface of the paint are beautifully worked and varied across the image. Victoria Crow was born in 1945. She moved to Scotland in 1968 when she joined the teaching staff of Edinburgh College of Art. Two years after she moved to Kitley Now, a hamlet near Carlops, near the Pentland Hills. The landscapes around her home have always been key elements in her works and as backgrounds to her portraits. This piece reminds us of the beauty of winter trees and their patterns against sky and land. I hope you've enjoyed these descriptions of images from the exhibition Shifting Vistas 250 Years of Scottish Landscapes. I've described that very important historical view of the city of Edinburgh with its kind of theatrical backdrop feel and those key buildings picked out which is such a key record of a moment in time and then we've zoomed forward in time to that amazing view of the castle esplanade by Lavery and lovely blues painted at the time of in a time of war and yet having that kind of great sort of peace and beauty about it and then that exquisite peplow with its soft feather-like brush strokes, kind of recording the peace and tranquility of Iona and the intensity of the blue sea. And then my favourite one, the Wilhelmina Barnes Graham, the rock on the Silly Isles with its kind of strange surreal quality and the power of the way she handles the lines and the shading to create this vast kind of sense of the rock scale and the lovely textures in the distance as she scratches into the paint. And finally, the image by Victoria Crow, a much more recent image of the trees against the sky. So it's nice that we've been able to do a kind of sweep through these landscape paintings. And I hope you'll enjoy listening to these again and maybe visiting the exhibition yourself.